right, to get us started with chapter three, I just want to look at a particular chemical that's known for causing sweating, vomiting, a uh, big component in acid rain. Uh, this chemical, when it is in its uh, gas state, uh, solid liquid gas, when it's in that gas phase, it can cause severe burns. Uh, if you accidentally inhale it, it can kill you. Major contributor to erosion. Um, actually, if you're interested, there is a whole field in science um, that looks at the corrosion and erosion uh, process in manufacturing. Uh, car brakes, uh, when it comes in contact with car brakes, decreases the effectiveness. Uh, it's been found in tumors of uh, cancer patients. So any idea what this chemical might be called? And if you looked at chapter three, you should know that we are talking about the properties of water. Um, and when I introduced this to the little kids, you know, I got a good story and I've got them really going at this point that definitely should ban dihydrogen monoxide, uh, which is otherwise known as water. Uh, it's pretty interesting. Um, if you go online, I also use a series of sites to teach the kids that anybody can put anything on the internet. Um, and there's a middle school teacher who has a whole s website devoted to banning dihydrogen monoxide. Uh, so pretty interesting. So we are in chapter three, uh, water and the fitness of the environment. We were we are going to be doing a lab um, that talks about uh, water's properties and kind of what's important. Um, emphasis on the AP test, but I just wanted to give you a, a brief little lecture about it also. So why study water? Um, well, if you look at life. Um, water is a major component um, and if we look at kind of our basic building blocks of life with the cell um, there is water both inside the cell and outside the cell and that balance of what goes in and what comes out of the cell as far as water um, is very important so back throw back to physical science water does exist in three phases solid liquid and gas uh, hopefully you learned this in chemistry a little bit, the idea of behind a polar molecule. Um, we look at water, um, the oxygen, I often like to call it the electron hog, um, because most of the time if you look at snapshots of water molecules, you're going to find slightly more electrons towards that end. That gives it a negative charge. The hydrogens, these are just little tiny uh, atoms, and they each have usually one proton, this debate on how you deal with the electron and hydrogen too, we could have a whole discussion on also. Um, but it does have a slightly more charged end that is positive towards the hydrogen. So you get an idea of a pole uh, with a negative and a positive, just even looking back at what you know about magnets and how those work with a north pole, south pole, kind of the same idea. So hopefully this isn't a brand new concept uh, for you. Also looking at water, when it's bonding with the, its own atoms that make it up and also with other atoms, uh, you have something that's called a hydrogen bond that is formed. Uh, we're going to talk a lot more about hydrogen bonding uh, when we get into our macromolecules, uh, but it's very vital, this particular bond that's formed. It's different than our ionic bonds or our covalent bonds or a metallic bond, um, and it's really something that is unique um, to living things versus the non-living world. So I know your textbook goes into depth with a lot more about water. What I am concerned about though um, as far as emphasis on our test is looking at the five major properties of water. So give yourself space to get into those five properties. So the first one to look at, and I know I just told you five, this does not count as two, um, cohesion and adhesion really kind of go together. Um, cohesion, what we're looking at here, um, along with adhesion, is how does water behave in the presence of other water molecules? Um, and what's interesting is that, again, here comes that hydrogen bonds again, of how one water molecule will stick. It's often used that term, instead of bond, 
as scientific as it sounds, we do sometimes just use stick to others. Where this comes into life science then is this explains how you could have a redwood tree in the Redwood National Park that is very, very tall and it almost looks like it's defeating gravity in getting that water to its upper portion where the leaves are. Um, hopefully you know water is an integral part to the photosynthesis process and cellular respiration process. So this is a fluid transport in plants. We'll talk more about that at the plant unit. Um, but you can also see this if um, you have looked for the meniscus in chemistry uh, to measure a volume. It'll form a tall column and the bonds, that stickiness is so strong that that column rarely breaks. So again, unique property to life, something that makes it very useful to living things. Surface tension, again, kind of goes along with the stickiness of cohesion, um, but it looks, you know, if, if we get chemistry-wise, it almost looks like you have a skin that's formed. Um, usefulness to this, you do have uh, insects that can walk on the surface um, of water. So you see some unique properties there. I always have to correct my kids with this. I'm not sure where you learn about water as the universal solvent. Um, that is definitely not true, but I would say that it is a very good solvent. It is a polar, so that's very helpful if you have another polar molecule like glucose or enzymes, uh, which we find a lot of in life. It would be really good to help dissolve things there. but the classic example that I like to tell the kids. When you mix oil and water together, the oil does not dissolve. Why does that happen? Well, water works with other polar molecules. It will not dissolve things that are nonpolar, such as lipids. And we're going to talk about lipids here in a little bit, but we talk about what doesn't dissolve in water is anything that is nonpolar, something that is called hydrophobic. If you break that down into Latin, it means water fearing. They don't have an attraction to water. And I've got a picture of a fat on here uh, called a triglycerol that I'll show you a little bit more about when we get into the life molecules. Another property of water is its high heat capacity. Um, it can absorb or release all types, large amounts of heat. I don't know there's different types of heat, but all large amounts of heat without seeing a big temperature change. Um, you should have in physical science done one of the, the classic temperature graphs, and I think I have one coming up here a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, it's a very stable molecule. Um, as far as when it's combined in air temperatures. Um, and it also, if you're going to want to change the state of water, um, it's going to take you a lot of energy to do that. Uh, this is why we have to use a gas stove or an electric stove to get our water to boil. You just can't get water to boil sitting in uh, air temperature, room temperature. So this high heat capacity, if I give you the example of looking at in humans, um, blood, it is our transport medium for pretty much everything that needs to get along in our bodies along with heat. Um, your blood, majority of it is water, so it can carry that warmth to cooler locations in the body. Again, water's boiling point, 100 degrees Celsius. If you look at the boiling points on most of the periodic table of elements, that's a pretty high one um, compared to elements at other liquid forms. Again, lots and lots of energy, and what that energy is going towards is breaking apart, you guessed it, hydrogen bonds. This is a chart I was talking about um, that I know you probably have made in physical science as you watched ice melt. Um, and then heat it up. Uh, the phase changes, if you're looking at from point A to B, that is when it's in its solid form. Um, from B to C, you have a phase change going on here. So you have both ice and liquid water. We call this melting. Uh, then if you look at C to D, you're in the liquid state. 
D to E, again, you have another phase change occurring, liquid water and vapor, and then E to F is all in water vapor. Well, what's interesting is looking right up here um, with the larger red oval, this heat of vaporization, organisms' life has found a very um, advantageous way of using that. Uh, we sweat, and so as that liquid water on our skin goes into vapor, that gives you a cooling effect. Um, Tigers would use that if they pant, and your dog also does that. Uh, what's interesting is animals who pant typically don't have uh, sweat glands like humans do, so they're actually losing that water through their tongues. Again, the idea of you know, maintaining homeostasis, a constant internal environment, if you're doing something like crunches that is um, working your muscles, releasing a bunch of heat, that's when your body click, kicks in the whole sweating idea uh, to release that extra energy and to cool the body down. So other little things that we could put in here, uh, density, water is pretty unique uh, when it comes to this property. It's actually less dense as a solid than as a liquid due to uh, here is our pattern again, hydrogen bonding. And the special case of ice, what makes it so unique um, is that ice floats. Uh, the hydrogen bonds that form um, are a very stable crystalline state um, that has these very uh, repeating structures that happen. Most of the time, not all substances, but most of the time when a substance is in its solid state, it's more dense. Um, if that's the case with water, we are going to have ice that would sink. Instead, uh, because ice is less dense, it floats. And that's really what sustains life in any aquatic environment um, that freezes. Um, oceans and lakes that don't freeze solid um, all the way through is usually because the surface ice is insulating the water below, allowing things to live there. Um, if the ice would sink, you would have a completely solid lake. Um, this also, we'll talk a little bit about this with ecology, um, but the density of water um, it's most dense around 4 degrees Celsius, actually causes little miniature cycles to happen within a pond or a lake. And it recycles along with it nutrients. Um, so that's how you keep, uh, your, you know, if you have something that's a dead or dying organic matter that's breaking down in the bottom of the lake, um, it's called turnover. Um, it'll actually cycle up to the surface of the lake, uh, feeding algae, plankton, anything like that that's living there. Um, again, that low density as a solid uh, keeps ice as an insulator uh, for life below it. Other things that's kind of unique about it, it is very uh, transparent uh, liquid. Uh, this allows light to penetrate uh, bodies of water, so you can have photosynthesis that occurs. Um, organisms have adaptations that allow them to do photosynthesis at particular um, depths beneath, um, so they kind of form their own little niches uh, to reduce competition with each other. Very common in protists and some algae. Again, maybe a little bit of a review with physical science, but if we look back at pH, um, water dissociates into H plus ions and OH ions. Um, and if you think about the pH, it's a measurement of either H pluses or o, OH minuses, depending on how you were taught. Again, if you look at acids, bases, solids, just some general stuff, anything between lemon juice to bleach, water is very unique in that uh, deionized water is usually around a 7. Uh, most tap water, by the time they go through the treatment and add some things, um, in Ohio anyways, uh, because a lot of our water comes from a limestone base, we're a little bit more on a 7.58 scale. That's typical. Um, other regions of the world, it does differ a little bit depending upon where the groundwater is and what it's coming from. 
when we get into a little bit about our metabolism, we'll talk about buffers. Um, but again, that water serves as a place um, to either accept or donate H pluses, and that just helps to minimize major swings in pH. Um, we have all sorts of buffer systems set up in our bodies um, because we need to we want to be able to keep a constant internal environment and most cells like to be right around the 7 pH. Uh, pH can do anything to um, change the shape of a molecule. Remember that with enzymes and denaturing them so that if an enzyme doesn't work then there's probably a cascade of molecules or functions that um, are affected down the line. Um, so how we control pH is by a buffer system. And again we'll get a little bit more about that into class. So I hope that was a short little overview of water, kind of hits on the main points. Um, again, we'll reinforce this in class with the lab. All right, as always, if you've got any questions or concerns or problems, make sure you check out my websites and email me any of those.